Hello and welcome to the Women's Weekly Bible Challenge. I'm Lisa Ann Spencer. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Um, today, before we jump into what is going to be part three, it's the fourth video in this series. The first one was an introduction, but today is part three of When the Holy Spirit Speaks to Women. Uh, I want to have a little bit of a heart-to-heart -heart talk with my followers, my subscribers, um, and those of you who may have just stumbled upon this channel recently. Um, I want to um, say some things about my Bible study and how and why I do this, and just to let you know what's on my heart. So these Bible studies that I do these are just my own personal Bible studies. This is actually how and what I am studying currently. Of course, I'm studying several different things, but um, this series, when God speaks to women, and when Jesus speaks to women, and when the Holy Spirit speaks to women, these are things that I, I have been studying through the Scripture on my own for a long time. Um, as a woman, I really... Uh, appreciate and want to know about the women in the Bible. And I want to know for myself. I don't want to go buy the book, uh, you know, all the women of the Bible and just kind of have it as a reference tool. I really want to get to know the women and what God, what we can learn about God through studying women. So this just happens to be one of those personal Bible studies of mine. I also study through Proverbs. Um, very frequently, and I have an ongoing Proverbs study on Facebook that I am doing right now, a commentary on each chapter of the book of Proverbs. I do these things. People ask me sometimes, you know, to present, like I was asked to come to this Facebook page and uh, please be a part of the Proverbs study and submit my daily lessons and commentaries. So, um, but I do these for myself. I do them because I'm laboring in the Word for my own benefit, and I learn things, and I'm so excited about what I learn, and the things that I learn I share with my children at home. I share with my husband. He studies, and he has his things that he study, and we're usually not studying the same thing together. Now, sometimes we'll be reading through the Bible as a family, and we'll, of course, talk about the things that we're when we're on the same page. But anyway, I talk to friends about it. Um, I like to have coffee with the ladies and um, you know share the things that I've been learning. I like to hear what the other ladies have learned in their Bible study. So what I'm saying to you here is I don't do these studies. I mean, I hope that they're beneficial to others. Um, I know that as a young mom with six children, homeschooling, you know, being a keeper at home, and all the responsibility that comes with that. I did not have the time that I do now um, to spend hours and hours studying the Word of God, but I would listen to others who did, older women and men who labored in the Word, and they share what they learned, and that helped me. It saved me time. I was able to grasp things and understand them because of someone else's labor in the Word. Now, could they be wrong? Absolutely. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. And that's why I stress to you over and over again in these studies, study these things for yourself. And I know you don't believe them just because I tell you, but I'll, I try to use the Bible I try to show you where they are in the Bible, and that's why I encourage you every time we start. If you do follow along, you know, if you can, sit down with your Bible and look at these scriptures as we're going through them. They make so much more sense when you're able to see them for yourself. Now, you know, some of you are very familiar with scripture, so you can listen while you're doing housework, and you do know the Bible verses. But I hope when something catches your attention and you're like, oh, I didn't catch that before because that happens to me all the time. Go and write that down. But my goal is not to get people to follow me. I am not after followers. Um, I am simply just bubbling over 
with the beauty of the truth that I learn in the Word of God and I want to share that with you. Um, I, I want to say that I am not a woman preacher and preaching I think is when you get up in a pulpit like Joyce Myers and Beth Moore and um, those um, ladies are out of the will of God. Um, it doesn't matter how great they are at preaching. If they're in a pulpit and in authority over a congregation, which includes men and families, they are out of order. In the study of when the Holy Spirit speaks to women, we will get to those passages in Scripture that just makes that so clear. Um, thousands of years of church history also make that clear, but it's the Bible. We don't worry about history and we don't worry about man's opinion, but we should care about God's opinion and His Word and what He says. So I do not advocate women preaching and I'm not trying to be a woman preacher. I'm trying to be a friend to women who need some encouragement from an older woman in their life. Maybe you have a lot of young children and you're not able to spend the time and maybe my studies can help you. And one day, if the Lord tarries to call us home in the rapture or in death, then you'll grow old and you'll have free time and then you're going to be able to then take what you've learned here from me or from others and then share that with other women. Another thing I want to say is this topic of women in the scripture. Um, you don't hear these women being spoken of um, by pastors in the pulpit every now and then, Mother's Day, or if they're doing a line-by-line -line Bible study and they come across a woman, they may mention it. But it is really out of their sphere of their mind to dive deep into the scripture on things that pertain to women. I believe God does leave that to us older women to do, and that is what I've intended to do in this study. I also wanted to mention that I have a blog. Most of you know that, and it is linked in the description below. Um, but I'm going to link to a specific study that I did a while back um, on women teaching. I actually went through every reference in the scripture where it talks about women or a woman teaching. And um, that's a very good study. Um, and I would encourage you to go back and watch or listen or read it on the blog. Um, I think the blog is superior. The written word is always superior because you can go back and reference it. And when I speak, I'll often say things wrong. And, um, you know, I can go back and edit my videos as far as put in the description, you know, I misspoke here, but in the blog I can go back and I can actually edit if I said anything wrong or I gave a wrong scripture reference. So I would really encourage you, you know, um, if you want to go back and review my studies, review the blogs. They are far better quality. Okay, so that um, study on women's teaching, I make it so plain where I stand, and I stand where Scripture stands. Um, women are not to preach. They're not to have authority over men, um, but women can teach their daughters. They can teach younger women, and I just don't believe that it's limited to teaching you how to cook and clean and be a good wife. Um, I... Um, and maybe I'll change my mind about that one day, but for right now, I don't. When I study the women in Scripture and I see their character and when I know where I'm at in the will of God and how in God's eyes, I am an adult daughter. I'm a mature daughter in the Lord. He gives me grace and liberty. That's the thing about having Christ formed in you you, it's like you know what pleases your father and what displeases him. And so I'm going to continue to do these studies and share them with you. But I urge you, do not make me an authority. And I know you're not. Um, I want to be an encouragement to you. I want to help you as a woman to woman. If you're a man listening to this study, um, 
you probably need to go find yourself a man to learn from. And look, I have grown sons now, and I've home educated them, and I taught them doctrine from the Word of God. I did not want them to be ignorant about that. Um, my husband was unsaved for many years, and he couldn't teach my son's doctrine. We lived far away from a church. Um, we did not have access to a good Bible teaching, believing church. So um, I'm thankful that I knew doctrine and I've been able to teach it to my sons. Uh, but men do need men. They need a godly father. And we all need a godly pastor who preaches the word of God. Um, he preaches the Bible, um, and he doesn't interpret it himself. He teaches you how to study it yourself and let the Bible interpret itself. So I have such a church for which I'm thankful for, but there are lots of churches online that have good pastors that stand on the Word of God. They defend it and they preach it. So what I am going to do is I'm going to include a link below a list to several pastors that our family has listened to over the last five years. Um, many different personality types and um, they live all over the United States and you know check some of them out if you don't have a church or if your local church is very weak on preaching the Word of God, by all means, support your local church. But maybe some of these men you can go to and you can begin to increase your knowledge in the Word of God. It is what God wants us to do. So very specifically, I have a dear friend, um, and her husband is a pastor. They're very young. They moved here. Um, they live in South Carolina. They have driven two and a half hours to come to our church because they don't have a church, but that's too far for them. They have a, a YouTube channel. Uh, they, they're home Bible ministries. They do Bible teaching in their home, and I just want to give them a shout out. I'm going to put them first on the list and ask you to please go by and check them out. They're very isolated where they live, and it would be very encouraging to them if you took the time to just check out their channel home Bible ministries give them a subscribe and some likes and some watch time and maybe communicate with them my friend Sarah the wife um, she is a very sweet girl and I know she would be encouraged by some of you women reaching out to her so anyway that's my heart to heart that's what I wanted to talk to you about today and um, tell you uh, how encouraging it is to me when I hear from you, when you ask me questions like, um, where do I get started studying the Bible for myself? Or, you know, you said this and that really helped me understand this passage. I'm so grateful for those things and it's very encouraging to me. But I also want to say that um, if there was no one watching me, I would still do these studies. I would still record them even for my daughters. I won't be here forever, and I do want them to have access to these. And I do it because when you read and study anything, Bible or sewing or gardening, um, to be able to teach someone what you've learned or tell them in a coherent manner, to speak it out loud is very helpful in solidifying that knowledge in your brain. It's part of the learning process, um, the rhetoric stage when you're getting mature and you're able to um, teach others what you've learned. And it's no different with scripture. So if you have a neighbor or a sister or a friend and you're learning these things, by all means, speak to them share what you've learned. And most of all, make sure that the people that you're talking to are saved. Uh, not everyone who says they're a Christian is saved because the meaning of Christian has been hijacked by a lot of uh, social type churches that don't even know that the Lord 
is God, that he was virgin born, that he died to pay for everybody's sins. So the gospel is clearly found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. It's found elsewhere in Paul's writings, but the gospel by which we're saved, how that Christ died for our sins. According to the scripture, he was buried and he rose again the third day. God accepted his payment. There's nothing we can do. We put our trust in his blood that he shed to pay for our sin debt. You have to do that personally. You can believe it like the devil believes in God. And a lot of people believe in historical Jesus, but they haven't put their trust in him. So when you're talking to anybody, the first thing you need to do is make sure they have an understanding of salvation. If they're saved already, they're not going to be offended that you try to share that with them. If they're not saved, you don't want to leave them in that lost condition. Um, it would be very cruel and unloving not to tell someone the truth that they'll have to pay the punishment for their sin if they don't trust in Christ. All right, I've already used up 16 minutes of this video. I do want to try to go on through this study. Um, this part where we're at in the book of Acts, and I've already mentioned to you Acts is a transitional book. It's a book of big changes. So it's very hard for me to go to this book and say, okay, let me look for where the Holy Spirit is speaking to women directly and let me teach on those passages because as I'm researching it, there's so much more to it. And I feel like Acts is very doctrinal, like you don't go there to get your doctrine, but you will fail to understand correct Bible doctrine if you don't see what's happening in the book of Acts. So that's why I am taking this time to go through Acts. I hope it's helpful, and I hope if you have any questions specific to the book of Acts, because I'm sure I am not being clear. It would take hours of teaching to make it clear. One of the things that I will do is my pastor is going through the book of Acts verse by verse. I will post that playlist in the link below for those of you who might like to just, you know, study through the book of Acts verse by verse. I highly recommend it. But um, we left off last week with the stoning of Stephen. And that was a very pivotal moment in the book of Acts and in the history of Israel. Um, so many things that were very subtle are happening. And I mentioned last week, I said, you know, the, God, the Bible doesn't spell out everything to us. The Bible doesn't say, okay, God changed the plan here because of Israel's response. And it doesn't say that. You have to study and see that for yourself. So the next thing that happens after the stoning is there is a scattering of the disciples out into um, mostly outward areas in the nation of Israel, but you have some that go up to Antioch and to the island of Cyprus. Um, and it says that they are preaching to none but the Jews only. Now, we're only in Acts chapter 8 right now. Last week, we talked about Philip. He was scattered, and he went to Samaria and preached. Um, and then the next thing that is going to happen is Saul's conversion. So Saul's conversion is the pinnacle in the book of Acts, and I don't want to try to rush through that. Of course, you can read it for yourself, and I would do that as a challenge for the coming week. In fact, I would say read um, Acts chapter 9 through 13. We still see like Peter, James, and John doing some ministry in the way that Jesus told them to do the ministry when he was on earth. But Jesus is making a change and calling Paul. So the things that Peter is doing, how he goes to Cornelius' house, a Gentile, and God, I say, had to force him. He gave him that vision of the unclean foods and he told him to eat. That was a command. 
and the Gentile man had sent to him. This Gentile man was um, a supporter of Israel and he was a believer in God. So Peter goes to Cornelius and shares with him what God puts on his heart to share. Um, the Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost and Peter and the Jews that are with him are astonished. They were not expecting that. They know that it is not God's plan. God's plan in the Old Testament was for Israel to have their kingdom established on the holy hill of Zion in Jerusalem. The law would go forth to all nations and the Gentiles would be blessed by blessing Israel. The Gentile world would come to the nation of Israel and bring their offerings to support the nation of Israel and Israel would teach them God's law. That's all that you see in the Old Testament. You never see a Gentile getting saved outside of the influence of a Jew, an Israelite. So they were astonished when Cornelius and the Gentiles spoke in tongues. But one thing that you don't see is you do not see Peter, James, and John going out to um, Gentiles from this point on and speaking to them. They just don't do it. And we know that because when we get to Acts chapter 15, we see that they actually have to hold this big meeting because of this issue of Paul is out preaching to the Gentiles and they're not keeping the law and the believing Jews who are keeping the law are totally they think that that's out of God's will. Something big is happening, and you have to understand the book of Acts in order to understand that. All right, I don't want to skip over Philip. After he speaks to the Samaritans, which are Jews, he goes down to speak to an Ethiopian eunuch. He's also a Jew. Um, we know that because it tells us in Acts 11 that they preach to Jews only. This Ethiopian eunuch uh, works for a woman, Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. This is not a random story. God did not put this in here just to tell a flowery story or be wordy. He has a very specific reason why he's doing this, and it's during this transition period that he's doing it. I'm going to include some bonus material about the Ethiopian eunuch in my blog. So if you want to know more about that, um, then please check that out. And then also, after Cornelius' conversion, Peter visits a widow who is dead, and he raises her from the dead. This is also a very significant um, miracle that's recorded in the Bible, not just randomly, but for a specific reason. And I'm not saying that I understand all that, but what I'm saying is I do know that there's a transition happening, and we're seeing Peter and the apostles and the disciples, their ministry is diminishing. And Saul is saved, and from Acts chapter 13 and onward, it is Saul who takes the gospel of the grace of God to the Gentile world. That's the dispensation of grace where we live right now. And you have to see these changes that happen in the book of Acts. So I encourage you to read those for yourself. And I'm not going to try to go any further today. Um, as I said, just read um, Acts 9 through 13 and maybe even go on to 15 if you like. But um, notice some of these changes. Um, two things specific I do want to mention is that the Ethiopian, uh, he has come to Jerusalem to worship and he's leaving. So instead of selling all his goods and laying them at the apostles' feet, he leaves and we don't hear from him again. That shows us that there is a change occurring. Philip goes to Caesarea and we never hear from him again. We see him in Acts chapter 21 and he's obviously, he's got a house. He's 
married if he wasn't already. He has four daughters and he continuously lives in Caesarea. He did not go into all the world and obey that commission that God had given the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles remain in Jerusalem. James, the brother of John, one of the 12 apostles, is murdered. Uh, Peter is put in jail and he is scheduled to be murdered, but an angel of the Lord visits him and helps him escape. Why was James not saved and Peter was? Um, that's because God needed Peter to be a witness of the Apostle Paul that God had turned to the Gentiles. You read that in Acts chapter 15. I would encourage you to read that for yourself. All right, so we'll t talk about a little bit more about Paul's salvation. And then I think after that, we're going to be able to jump right into um, the specifics then of the rest of the women in the book of Acts that we encounter, who they are, um, God speaking to them through the Apostle Paul primarily, and then we'll jump into the Apostle Paul's letters and we'll spend a couple of weeks there looking at all the scriptures where women are directly addressed by the Holy Spirit. So I hope you'll join me for those. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. <music>